I've been interested in nature since I was a tiny little guy. I first was interested in butterflies and beetles and insects, and then I gradually made the transition over into plants and uh, have been interested ever since. I guess I started when I was about seven years old. That interest in the systems of living things has driven Peter Raven throughout his life. For the past 35 years, St. Louisans have known him as the head of the Missouri Botanical Garden. In scientific circles, he is recognized as one of the world's preeminent botanists and a leader in the movement to control threats to the delicate balance of life on Earth. And though many of us enjoy the Missouri Botanical Garden for its beauty, it has, under the leadership of Peter Raven, grown into a major center of research, cataloging and analyzing plants in every corner of the world, often just one step ahead of their extinction. When I was a child, I never thought about extinction at all. I mean, almost nobody did in the 1940s and 50s, and it wasn't until the mid-60s that uh, a number of colleagues and I began to realize that life on Earth was being decimated, that shreds were being ripped out of it, and that it just wouldn't be the same. He understands the fragility of the linked living systems, Peter's... Uh, mission in life has been to uh, understand more about the plant species and uh, how they interact with the other living things on earth and to uh, carry the message uh, of what we need to do to preserve this wonderful world we live in. The Missouri Botanical Garden has been a center for research since Henry Shaw founded it in 1859. Today there are almost six million plant specimens in its herbarium, one of the largest collections in the world. And so here we can see plants, these are all from the state of Missouri. Here's one collected in uh, 1883 in Jackson County, the Kansas City, and then here's one collected in 1933 in Jackson County. Some of these can be really old and they keep the, the structure and the form and their notes about the color and so forth very often and, uh, and uh, you can section them, you can take chemicals out of them, they're just dried, you can section them and look at the cells inside them so when you have six million of them you really have something to work with. It was Henry Shaw who in 1885 arranged that the garden's directors would also occupy the chair of botany at Washington University establishing a relationship that endures today. It was Peter Raven who expanded the garden's research programs, recruiting PhDs from universities around the world, and sending teams to Central and South America, Africa, and Madagascar to document plant life before it disappears. Lately also the garden is focusing uh, very much into conservation, um, because of uh, the changes that are happening in the world, um, deforestation, global changes that are affecting the, the biota, the flora, and the, the fauna in the world. So uh, the garden in, in, in that uh, way, it's a very unique place. The bad thing is that most of the species we're losing now, particularly in the tropics, we've never seen, we've never named, we don't even know of their existence, and yet uh, that's not a very good idea because we want to build a sustainable world using their properties. And uh, the best thing to do then, as the great conservationist Aldo Leopold put it, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the cogs and wheels. Beyond his connections within the scientific community, Raven has developed friendships and forged partnerships with political and spiritual leaders who have their own circles of influence. His collaboration with local institutions such as Washington University, the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and the Danforth Plant Science Center are key to the development of St. Louis as an internationally recognized center for the plant sciences. Over the last 30 years, Peter has done an outstanding job for St. Louis in elevating the visibility of our city, our region, our science around the globe. The research team at the garden has a skill of identifying where materials are, and, and then chemically defines what's in them. What the scientists at the Danforth Center do is take that information one step farther 
and ask how we can use the genetic information or the chemical materials in uh, these native plants in, in agriculture for human benefit or for environmental benefits. We expect a lot out of biology now. We expect to find the new foods and the new medicines and the, the biotechnical things, the ways to advance, the ways to build sustainable systems, and we expect that to come out of biology. As the international scientific community has come to expect more from the garden, St. Louisans too have seen significant changes over the past 35 years. Over the years, we developed the Kemper Center for Home Gardening, the Chinese Garden, the Lehman Rose Garden. The little lake that was dug in 1906 was enlarged by us in 1975 to form the lake in the Japanese Garden. We wanted to have a, a long, uh, a beautiful attraction in this corner of the garden so that people would come all the way into and through the garden. And we really made it a garden where there were all kinds of gardens, many different kinds of gardens to see inside the main garden. Because a botanical garden is not a park and shouldn't be confused with a park, a botanical garden is a place more like an art museum or a zoo that displays lots of different kinds of things in it. Underlying all of his achievements is an indomitable optimism. It's justifiable to be an optimist and never to tire if you think you can make a real difference about the future. And if we can make a real difference individually and collectively, then we'd better try to do it. But we're determining collectively, whether we realize it or not, what kind of a world we want. What kind of a world we want to live in now. How much fresh air, clean water, stable climates, uh, biological diversity to serve us, to to exist simply for its own right, to make life beautiful and interesting, how much of that's going to exist. When you finish your next 35 years, you'll be a little over 100. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm wondering uh, what, uh, what, uh, what your goals for the next 35 years are. I'll be nourishing plants directly 35 <laughs> years from now. <laughs> I won't have to worry about uh, getting people to do it for me.